Hallelujah. Well, we were inspired in our first session this evening to hear from Pastor Caramba about how we are to look to Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, found that joy to give him the strength. And he began to share with us about the victories that that joy would bring. But we want to more fully consider that as we close this section of Scripture and our seminar with this last session, capstoning this message of Hebrews that being surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we are to lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us. We are to run with endurance the race set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hallelujah. And so we want to title our last session, The Triumph of the Overcomers. Jesus in particular, of course, but he is the one who completed the race. He is the one that has made the way. He is the way and the truth and the life. And as we follow him, we will also complete that pathway, that race of the overcomers and enter in and have a portion of the triumph that Christ has awaiting his church, his bride. His church, the body of Christ. And so we want to look at the triumph of Christ, the overcomer, and the triumph he will bring us into as we complete our race by faith. Now, we know that Christ finished his race. As Pastor Dick mentioned, on the cross, he declared, it is finished. At the end, at 2 p.m., just before he died. The last words of his recorded in the Gospel of John. Now, it is finished from the original Greek New Testament. It was one word, tetelasti. And that was used in many different ways back at the time of the New Testament. If a son went out and completed an important mission for the family, he could come back home and report to his father, tetelasti. It is finished. Or if a king sent out his trusted army commander to go to war after the battles were over and the army commander would come back and report to the king, he would say, Tetelasti, it is finished. And so as Jesus died on the cross, he gave his last cry of victory. It is finished. He was going to return to the Father and say, I have accomplished the mission for which you sent me. He was going to declare, the battle is over. It is won that he had fought the good fight and finished the race. And so as Christ triumphantly died upon the cross, we also know that he descended into death into the lower parts of the earth. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 9 tells us, he ascended into the lower parts of the earth, and that's quoting from the Psalms, that then says, he led the captives free. Matthew says, the graves were open after his resurrection, and many of the saints arose. They, they, they just had a stopover in Jerusalem on their way up to the heavens that were opened by the resurrection and the ascension of Christ. Then we read how Christ ascended to heaven in Acts chapter 1, and a cloud received him out of their sight, and the disciples saw him no more, but the prophet Daniel saw the other side of this story when Christ, ascending up through the clouds, came and arrived back in heaven to present himself back before the Father. And so, let's look at a picture that tries to feebly portray this as we read a portion of Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, 10. 13 and 14. I watched until the thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days sat, whose robe was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. 
His throne was like flames of fire, and his wheels like burning fire. A stream of fire went out and came out from before him. A thousand, thousands served him. Ten thousands, ten ten, ten times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set. The books were opened. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. And came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And dominion and glory was given him, and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages would serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed." When Christ ascended back to the throne of his father to take his authority and his kingdom from which he can now declare all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now when Christ returned to heaven, he sat down on the throne of God, having finished his race and entering into his reward. And so then... After his victory, John had the vision where he saw in the midst of the throne stood the Lamb, Christ at the throne of God, seated, having rested from his great fight, his great race, his great victory. And now he sits in heaven, and he is resting in his triumph as The prophecy of the Father was, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I place your enemies as your footstool. That's the Lord God the Father said to my Lord God the Son, Sit at my right hand until I place your enemies as your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of Of your enemies. Now Christ is resting in his triumph as the victor, waiting for the timing of the Father, waiting for that full victory to be revealed, waiting until all the enemies have been placed under his feet. Christ is seated on his throne. He won the race, but he's waiting. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23 through 25, it tells us the steps to the end of the race, to the final victory of God. It says, but each one in his own timing, in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, afterwards, those who are Christ's at his coming, that's the second coming, and then comes the end when he, Christ, delivers up the kingdom to God the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. He sits triumphant in heaven, but he is waiting for us to finish our race and be prepared for his triumphant return so that when he returns and comes, he will be able to then bring us into the full reward that he has prepared for us. He's waiting for us to finish our race at the second coming, for the bride to be ready for the final triumph. Christ has finished and is in triumph. The church shall soon, at the second coming, finish the race and enter into his triumph and reward. And so... Our Lord Jesus, almost the last words he declared in the Bible, in the last chapter of the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 12, he said, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Now, it is true, we do not earn salvation by our good works. Ephesians 2 makes it clear with many other scriptures, by grace we are saved, not of our own works, lest any man should boast. 
No, our own works can never give us the doorway into eternal life in heaven. However, it did cost. There was a work. There was a price. It's not our good works. It was the good work of Jesus Christ on the cross that is open the gates of eternity and victory and triumph for us. But while Jesus opened the door and made the way for us, he also has said that it is our works done by the power of the Spirit, done in the name of Jesus, that then we will be eternally rewarded for. We will gain triumph with Christ. We will have eternal rewards and honor from how we run and finish our race. How many years, Pastor Dick? 31, if Jesus doesn't return, I, I, I'm a lot closer, okay? <laughs> Hallelujah. But, I, but I, hope, I hope I'll run a good long race too, okay? And be able to still accomplish so much more because we will be rewarded. We will be positioned in the kingdom of God according to the works we accomplish for Christ and his kingdom here in this life, according to how we win our race, we'll get the bronze or the silver or the gold. Now, when Christ returns from heaven as the king of kings to sit on his throne, he declared in Revelation 3.21, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my father in his throne. Now, we really couldn't get a, a picture of that, of Jesus sitting with his father, and then we are sitting with them both in Christ, in the father on the throne. That, that'd be a little hard for an artist, okay? But Christ is one with the father, and we are going to be the bride of Christ who is going to be one with him. He has entered into the victory and triumph of the father sitting on the throne of God. And we will also share in that triumph and victory if we run our race well, if we overcome. Christ will return from heaven as the king of kings to sit on his throne in Jerusalem for 1,000 years. As Isaiah prophesied in the portion of chapters that's sometimes called the mini apocalypse. It's a visions of the last days coming up to the second coming of Christ. And in, Revel, in Isaiah 24, verse 23, it says, culminating in the, the troubles of the last days, the judgments of God, and the return of the Messiah, it says, for the Lord Almighty shall reign on Mount Zion in Jerusalem and before his elders with great glory. Yes, he will sit on the throne in Jerusalem. And we further read in Zechariah 14 the beautiful prophecy of the Lord Jesus returning when the Jews in Israel are having the last war that they're losing and just before they're wiped out when there's no more natural hope that they'll win and they're crying out for salvation. There is no hope in the flesh. They're hoping that their Messiah will come. Then it says in Zechariah 14, then the Messiah's feet will touch the Mount of Olives, will come down to Jerusalem. Christ will reveal himself as the Messiah, as the Savior, shall destroy the enemy armies opposing them. And then in verse 16, it says that it shall be that any, everyone who is left of all of the nations, this is for the thousand years in the millennium, they shall go up yearly to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, Jesus in Jerusalem, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. Now in modern years, Christians from around the world Go to Israel just at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, in usually in October in our calendar. 
and many thousands gather from different nations, and they'll have a march through Jerusalem. They stir the capital of Israel with their flags, flying the flag of Israel, flying the flag of, of Ethiopia, the flag of Sweden, the flag of the United States. Uh, do I see a, a flag of the Philippines? Uh, where's Nepal? Where's India? They're going to be in there. All the nations will go up yearly to Jerusalem to honor the king of kings ruling the world on his throne in Jerusalem. He who was despised and rejected has become highly exalted and given the name of Jesus, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, sitting on the throne as ruler of the world. And yet, while he does that, he's not going to be the only one sitting on a throne in the coming kingdom. We read that King David is, uh, and many others are going to sit on thrones. In Revelation 20, verse 4 and 6, that in the, first, in the second coming of Christ, at the first resurrection, John said, I saw thrones, and they sat on them. And they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him, with Christ, for a thousand years. Those who finish their Christian race well will also share in his triumph, the triumph of the overcomers that finish their race well. And among those that will share in his triumph, that will sit on thrones, that will rule and reign with Christ, in this world. Well, Jesus is the king of all kings, but that suggests there will be individual kings over the nations. And we read very clearly in prophecies of Ezekiel and Jeremiah that David will be raised from the dead in the millennium to rule the nation of Israel. And so you can study in Jeremiah 30 where it's talking about uh, the great tribulation called Jacob's Trouble earlier in that chapter, and then after the troubles of the last days, then after the Messiah returns, they shall serve the Lord their God, the Messiah, and David their king, who I will raise up for them. In the first resurrection, David will be installed, not as the king of all kings, he will be one of the kings, the king of Israel for 1,000 years. Now, Jesus also declared that the 12 apostles, they would also sit on thrones, not as kings, but lesser thrones as governors. And so when, when Peter asked him, Lord, what will be our reward in the resurrection? Jesus said to them, truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration or in the resurrection, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, you also shall sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, Israel was geographically divided into 12 tribes or 12 provinces, 12 states, and each of the 12 apostles will rule as a governor over a province or state. Not Judas Iscariot. He disqualified himself by his sin. He was replaced we read in Acts chapter 1 by another disciple named Matthias. And Peter later said, in one of his letters, he said, make your uh, calling and election sure. Make your calling. Make your future position in God secure. He saw Judas lose his promised throne. One out of the 12 didn't make it. The other 11 did. And they will be governors. So Jesus will be the king of all kings. But under that, there will be kings over the various nations. The Bible tells us David will be the king of Israel. The Bible doesn't tell us who will be the king of Israel, but I have a suspicion it might be Joseph in the book of Genesis that might be the most great and godly leader Egypt ever had. And I uh, just imagine that quite possibly the most faithful and uh, uh, glorious ruler that Iran or ancient Persia ever had 
was Queen Esther. Maybe she'll be raised and we won't have a king in, in Persia. We'll have a queen, Queen Esther, ruling. And there will be governors over all of the provinces of Israel, over all of the states of the United States, over all the provinces of the Philippines. There will be governors. And Jesus also in Luke 19 talked about when the triumphant uh, man came back with his kingdom, he would give cities to his faithful servants. So there will be mayors, the king of kings under him, the king of each nation under them, governors under them, mayors. And the Bible just uh, stops there and can't tell us everything. But a logical uh, uh, extension of that is you need more than just a mayor to run a city. You need a lot of people in the mayor's office and in the mayor's government. And so there in the Philippines, we'll probably have some of the overcoming saints sitting as all of the barangay captains and maybe the sitios. They'll all have the chairmen and chairwomen that ran their race well. And maybe the sitios won't have thrones, but they'll have chairs, okay, for the chairmen and the chairwomen. Okay, lesser thrones for the chairmen, chairwomen, okay? But still, glorious to rule and reign in righteousness in the coming kingdom of God. There will be multitudes Millions that will enter into the triumph of the overcomers when the race is finished and Christ returns to set up his millennial kingdom over all the earth. Hallelujah! Now, not only will victorious Christians be rulers in the coming kingdom, they will also be priests. And so we read in many scriptures, such as Revelation 1, 6, that God has made us a kingdom priests to our God or a kingdom of priests or kings and priests. Some translations have it. In 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood that can accurately be translated. You are a kingly priesthood. So there will be rulers Kings, governors, mayors, barangay captains, sitio chairman. There will be rulers in every nation. There will also be priests because it will be the kingdom of God over all the earth. And so many people in the resurrection will rise to take the ministry of the priests. And we can't begin to look in a few short minutes. Well, we'll begin, but we can't exhaust looking at the ministries of a priest. But one of the important ministries of priests is that they are to be teachers. And so in Malachi chapter 2, we read, the priest's lips should keep knowledge. They should seek the law in his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. A priest, a New Testament, godly, born-again Christian who becomes a priest in the millennium. He should be the messenger of God. He should teach the ways of God. In the Old Testament, it was the priests who were the teachers of Israel. And they were to teach the people the difference between the clean and the unclean. Teach them the ways of God. And so, in the coming kingdom of God, there will be many that will not just rule over the earth, but many that will be priests that will be teaching the people. And Zion in the Bible has a strong calling to teaching ministry. In the Old Testament, also in our experience, for those of you who are part, if you've come to Zion Ministerial Institute or you're part of a, a Zion church, you know that teaching is a great strength and importance that is emphasized in the part of the body of Christ that God has called us to be, to exhibit and to teach Zion. And so, back in 1993, a few years after we started Zion Ministries of the Philippines, my wife and I were praying one Sunday night in our uh, rented home. And as we were praying, God gave me a vision and began to speak to me from Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3. And the Lord spoke 
this prophecy that's of the last days and the millennium, that in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be raised up above the other mountains and hills, and many people, many nations shall go and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And as this scripture was being spoken to my heart, I had a vision that here up in Antipolo, up in the hills over Manila, that there would be multitudes that would begin to stream to Zion to a Bible school and ministry we were to start here and that it would be a ministry that would reach out to the nations. Now, tonight we have maybe a dozen nations being represented in the Zoom and Facebook, uh, you brothers and sisters listening, and many hundreds, perhaps over a thousand right now from around the world that are listening to that which comes forth out of spiritual Zion where God will teach us of his ways, where from Zion will go forth the law, will go forth the clear teachings of God. And so we seek to be a teaching ministry to help you. As my wife mentioned, we have a, uh, we have a website, Zion, P-H, six letters, Z-I-O-N-P-H dot com. And we've got dozens of books and hundreds of videos and MP3s and, and, and different helps. They're all free for you to study and study and study the Word of God and be built up to run the race with endurance, to know your calling set before you, to be able to press on to the mark of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. And so that's for the Old Testament Zion. It's for those who are spiritual Zion. And in the millennium, when Jesus rules from Jerusalem, it will be a literal Zion again where there will be teaching going forth from Christ and the leaders. Now, there will be teaching emphasized all over the world in the millennium. Many of you are called to be teachers. You're, many of you are teaching, and others of you aren't teaching yet, but get ready. That's part of your calling. But there are other priestly ministries. There are the ministries of song leaders, of musicians, of singers. Priests are to lead the worship. In the Old Testament, David appointed only the Levites, the consecrated priests, to be the singers, the musicians, to play the cymbals, the harps, blow the trumpets. And it is a, a, a truth to us that those who will lead in worship and music ministries need to be consecrated, set apart as priests, as servants of God that will worship in spirit and in truth. And so if you love music, if you love uh, musical instruments or singing, consecrate it to God. It's not, just, uh, it's not just technical excellence. It's not just skill that's important. That, it is important. But what's more important is that we are consecrated worshipers in spirit and truth. And there will again be multitudes of song leaders and musicians and singers as well as teachers and others functioning in, uh, in priestly ministry in the coming kingdom of God. There will be great worship celebrations that we'll rejoice with in the millennium. Now, my wife, the first time she was in Israel about 20 years ago, she saw at the end of Shabbat, of Sabbath, there was a large group of Israelis that gathered and started dancing with joy before the Lord. And one of them explained to her afterwards, oh, we have about 200 dances in which we celebrate before the Lord. Wow, the Jews have 200 different dances? How many dances do we have in the church? You know, you get a little jump. Maybe one person, you know, spins around. Very rarely, two people might, you know, hold their hands, you know, or, or be a chain. But we have three or four 
ways to express our joy and celebration. In the millennium, we're going to have a thousand years to learn how to do it better and better and better. Hallelujah. Then we're really going to have worship celebrations. It's that of David in Psalm 68. He had a procession that came into the sanctuary with the singers going before and then the musicians and then the ladies with the tambourines and with the dance. And it was quite a celebration that he had. In Solomon's temple, they had it really worked out to be glorious. And then the, glory, the real glory of God fell. But we're going to see celebrations like we've never seen them before in the thousand-year kingdom of peace and prosperity and joy that our Lord Jesus is going to bring us into. And there will be feasts as part of our priestly ministry. There were Three feasts a year are originally given by, ex, by Moses in Exodus and Leviticus. And then there were more added on later, the Feast of Purim and others in Jewish history. And uh, today, the Jews and Christians celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. It's the Feast of Harvest. It's prophetic of all the nations coming before the Lord. They're having practice sessions every October in Jerusalem in recent years. But we're going to see the real glorious things, the real celebrations when Jesus sits on his throne in Jerusalem. And Passover, that's an important feast for the Jews and for Christians. We celebrate the resurrection of Christ. That's going to be great. There may be other uh, celebrations and holidays. Maybe we'll celebrate the, the day that Jesus returns, May 11 or October 15, whenever it is. Maybe we'll celebrate Liberation Day for the world. And I have the suspicion that, you know, if we can just get Jesus to tell us what was the real day he was born, you know, December 25, nah. What was the real day? He, he certainly would know. Well, I think maybe we will be able to purify Christmas. Yeah. You know, Santa Claus will be out, rejected. Rudolph the reindeer, well, he's kind of cute, but he's not going to be in the millennium. He's not going to be part of our Christmas celebrations. Frosty the snowman, uh-uh, okay. But nativity scenes, what a wonderful way to celebrate the birth of our Savior. Gift giving, well, the Magi did it, the wise men from the East, and you know, it's great to be able to give. And in the Philippines, paroles, symbol of the star of Bethlehem. Oh, let's see them all over the Philippines. How about all over the world? Okay. And let's... See what we can do in the millennium to celebrate the goodness and the greatness of our God. We will be kings, rulers, even chairmen and chairwomen, and we will be priests in the coming kingdom of God. And he has made us to be kings and priests unto our God, and we shall reign on the earth we read in Revelation 5, verse 10. Now, a lot of times when people talk about, you know, thrones in the coming kingdom of God and all of these, you know, glorious, you know, uh, things, uh, a lot of people say, well, I'm never going to be a king. I'm never going to be a queen. You know, I, I just hope I make it into the kingdom. But the Christian race is not just going to be won by a few ultra-spiritual saints. It's not just for the elect of the select. Winning the race is for all Christians who will wholeheartedly run after God. It's for all of us. We can all overcome the difficulties we face in running after God and fulfilling his calling as the Lord told Paul when Paul had great difficulty, he had a messenger of Satan buffet him. That means repeatedly beat him up. A messenger, an angel, it says in the Bible, a fallen angel of Satan was after him. And read about all his difficulties. You know, stoned and left for dead. Uh, whipped, uh, uh, beaten with rods three times. Whipped 39 lashes five times. Uh, you know, and he said, these light afflictions. 
compared with the glory coming. He, he doesn't seem like light afflictions. But in the midst of it all, he sought the Lord. Lord, can you take this from me? And the Lord told him, my grace is sufficient for you. The Lord did not say, I will rescue you from these trials. I will rescue you through these trials. You can run your race with endurance. You can go from strength to strength until you appear before God in Zion. God is able to give us all the road, the, the door of escape, the, the pathway upon which there will be victory. And each of us can fulfill our calling. Many millions, multitudes shall enter into great victory and triumph in the coming kingdom of Christ. Now, yesterday, Pastor Ma Nandy mentioned about someone who saw 90% of their young uh, friends in the ministry when he was in his 20s, I think, 30 years later, 90% of them had failed. And that sounds like a rather discouraging figure. Oh, no, does that mean nine out of ten of us will fail? Well, I don't think so. Not at all. In some places, in some Christian denominations, they're weak, they're, uh, they're not strong in the Lord, and there's going to be a lot of casualties. Some nations are backsliding, and, and, and even the Christians are being corrupted by, by the worldly society around them. And in some places, there will be many that will fall away. But in many places, the saints are going to run a good, strong, triumphant race. Here in the Philippines at ZMI, we took a survey some years ago of our graduates and find out, you know, how many are running a good race, how many are in the ministry. And we found that two-thirds of the graduates of the Bible school here were either in full-time ministry or were pastors. Many Bible schools around the world are happy if 10% are in the ministry. We have two-thirds. And the other third, most of them are in lesser positions of ministry. Maybe they're working to help support their family. No, almost everyone is running a good race. It's not like 90% have to fail. We can gather around saints pressing on in God, receiving good teaching, being strengthened by God so that we could be 90% who make it, not 90% who fail. And so, what can make the difference between many who fail and many who succeed? Well, your teachers make a great difference if you're taught. No compromise. Follow the ways of God fully. Learn the ways of God that God's blessing will always be on you. The vision you are presented is important. Is your vision to press on to the mark of the high call of God in Christ? Or is your vision just, well, you're saved. Once saved, always saved. You can sin, you know, we'll get to heaven. Eh, eh, eh. What's your vision? That's going to make a great difference in how you run your race. The worship that you experience. Are you part of a church? Do you listen to worship that's in spirit and truth? Or do you listen to Christian music that's all entertainment? Yeah, yeah. Okay, is it entertainment? Or do you listen to music and worship that's in spirit and truth, building up your inner man, strengthening you to be able to accomplish all of God's purposes. What about your fellowship? Do you join in with Christians that are wholehearted running after God? We read in Proverbs that he that walks with the wise will become wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. So we want to walk with the wise. We want to walk with those that are wholehearted for God. We want to read biographies of those who have fought the good fight and finished the race. We want to be those that have encouragers around us that will tell us that it's time to press on in God. We keep going. You can do it. Get up. You can do it. You can win the race. Hallelujah. God 
is for you. If God is for you, who can be against you? Hallelujah. Run the race with endurance. Amen. Hallelujah. We can all overcome the difficulties we face in running after God. His grace is sufficient for us. We can all join the heroes of faith that will overcome like the ones written in Hebrews 11. Now, Pastor Joe started us out with encouragement from just a few of the heroes of faith. We can't look at them all. Even the writers said, time will fail us if we tell you of all of the victories and all of the great men and women of God. Our, our time will fail us. We can't do it all. But I just want to look at just a very few just to show you that the heroes of faith, they weren't all miracle workers. They weren't all conquerors that conquered uh, kingdoms. No, a lot of them were very ordinary people with ordinary pressures. We read about Abraham. And yes, Abraham, he had different trials of faith. But the longest one he had was that he was a stranger in a strange land, lived among strangers. He didn't own any land. He didn't even have a house. He just pitched his tent. And when he and Lot were considering what direction to go and settle down, Lot chose the well-watered grasslands of the valley of Sodom, where a beautiful city to live in and prosperity for the, for the cattle and livestock. And Abraham went the other way up into the barren mountainside. He only lived in tents. And in uh, in Genesis chapter 18, verse 1, it says, He was sitting at the door of his tent on one day under the shade trees, the terebinths, and three strangers came by that he invited to come and join him and said, Rest under the shade. It was hot. Do you know how hot it is living in a tent? No air con. There was Lot down in Sodom. He had a nice stone house, you know, stone floors. It stays a lot cooler at day. Abraham had to go outside of the tent and be under the shade trees. He didn't live in a nice city. He was following God in purity and holiness. And the Bible says he was waiting for the city whose builder and maker is God. And so it says God has provided, has made a city for him and those that follow faithfully. So sometimes we don't live in the places we like or we're just renting a place that's hot and we don't like it. But maybe we're in the will of God and that's part of our running, our race of faith. Then we have the testimony of Sarah. And Sarah, she had a problem. She couldn't bear a son. But many of us have health difficulties and if you have a health problem, you might say, well, I can't really fulfill all of God's purposes. It's, you know, I, 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 you know, I can't do that ministry or this. Or, but we can overcome. God can help that even through health difficulties, as Sarah overcame, we can find God's grace. Maybe you need a healing. Maybe you need God's perseverance. It's not somebody who chased an army. no. Sarah just patiently prayed until God helped her health difficulty. Then we have the, uh, another testimony of Joseph, and Joseph was persecuted by his family. Do any of you ever get laughed at by your unsaved relatives? You know, I remember before my father-in-law got saved, uh, every time we would go and visit, he'd always get my wife aside, his daughter, and he'd say, when is Norman going to get a real job? You know, being a missionary apparently is not a real job, okay? <laughs> I don't work nine to five. I don't get the same paycheck or I don't know what. But we, we, we get pressure from relatives. We get mocked. We have uh, sometimes uh, difficulties, and, and Joseph was accused by his uh, uh, Potiphar's wife, by his employer's wife, slandered and uh, thrown in prison for uh, a crime he never committed. We can have these things happen to us. People can say, uh, go, we're going to sell you to a foreign land. Go work in Saudi Arabia. Don't come home, just send your money, okay? And it can be difficulties in, as we run our race by faith. 
And then we also have someone that many can relate to, Samson. He was listed in the heroes of faith of Hebrews 11. Yes, he failed God greatly, but he got up. He heard the voice of Pastor Abbott. When Pastor Abbott said, Get up! You can do it! Moses had worldly wealth and honor that he had to reject to follow the Lord's calling. And sometimes we have these same difficulties. Many times, our battles of faith are just normal, everyday situations where we need faith to fully follow God. And as I was writing this message, I felt the Lord impress on me that there are Samsons who are listening to the message tonight. Those who have had moral failure and have, for the time being, been knocked out of the race. And maybe you even still attend church, but you say, oh, I have sinned, I've failed God, I'm not in ministry, I'm not doing what I should be, I just can't do it, I, I always fail. Well, Peter failed and failed and failed until he started succeeding and succeeding and succeeding. We just have to keep trying until we learn to run our race with endurance. And Samson, at the end, when it looked like he was an utter failure, blinded, slave of the Philistines, he rose up and he prayed with a new consecration. Lord, give me victory over the enemies one more time. And as he as he broke down the temple of Baal and, and all of the lords and governors and generals of the Philistines were wiped out in that one collapse, that one celebration, Samson gained his greatest victory, and he is in the Hebrews 11, heroes of faith. And so Samson wants to tell us, get up. You're not dead. Stand up. Start running again. You can do it. You can start to win the race. You can overcome. You can do it. You can press on in God. You can have the victory. Arise, ye children of Zion. God will give victory. Hallelujah. And so at the end of our race, we want to be those that will be able to say like Paul, I have fought the good fight. I have fought finished the race. Now a crown of righteousness is waiting for me. And like our Lord Jesus, may we hear his testimony. He finished his race. He despised the cross, but for the joy set before him, he endured and he has sat down at his throne. He has entered his reward. And now he wants to encourage you to run the race with encouragement. May we all look to Jesus and find the grace, the strength we need to run our race to the end, triumphant. So let me invite the worship team to come back and let's sing the scripture in the book of Jude. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before his throne. To the only wise God, the honor, majesty, dominion, and power forever. <laughs>